Well, brothers and sisters, here we are, facing the second Sunday of Advent with this person of John the Baptist presented to us in the Gospel. Have you ever noticed that this loud, abrasive prophet never seems to be included in any holiday decorations? I once read that you'll never see John the Baptist on the outside of a Christmas card with the caption under the picture reading, You Brood of Vipers, and on the inside, Merry Christmas from our family to yours. No, that's not his style, nor his purpose. With his desert grime, grasshopper diet, and harsh words, he's not one we embrace easily. And yet, the gospel begins the Christmas story always with him. It all starts with him. And the message is clear. If you want to get to the joy of the manger, you first have to get past John at the Jordan. If you really want to see what's in Bethlehem's crib, you first must be confronted by this wild prophet in the desert. The church has always required it. In short, no Jesus without John. And who is the Baptist shouting at in this Sunday's gospel? Well, it's not the criminals of his day. It's not the thieves, the unbelievers, no. It's the good, decent, religious people of his day, people like you and me. They've come out to add his baptism, it seems, to their list of religious accomplishments. And he sees right through them. And he's not shouting encouragement at them. Rather, he's condemning them for looking for what you might call fire insurance. Insurance from the fires of hell. And even when they respond, you can't talk to us that way. We're decent people, sons and daughters of Abraham, the most faithful of the Jewish people. It makes no dent in John the Baptist's condemnations. Instead, he looks directly at them as he does at us, and he screams, repent. Repent, not just for your big sins, but for pretending they're not there. And not just for those big things, the infidelities, the thievery, dismissal of human life, but the small-mindedness, backbiting, jealousy, minor embezzlements, self-centeredness, grudges. It happened 2,000 years ago to a man named Saul, who later would be known as St. Paul, who realized he really, really had to repent. In his case, repentance from taking part in the murder of one of the first Christians. It happened centuries later to our diocese's patron, St. Augustine, who lowered his head, pondering his infidelity. You may not know his name, but it happened to a man named John Newton, who had to repent of his shameful, evil treatment of slaves. And after giving up the slave industry, he wrote a hymn, Amazing Grace. With time, it would be Dorothy Day repenting of her communism and abortion and promising not just to care for the poor, but to live among them. And now, today, it's you and me. And he really is standing there, poking us in the chest and demanding. And if you're serious about Christmas, you better take note of what he's telling you to do because he's not going anywhere. And he's going to continue standing right there and poking you in the chest until you do what all our ancestors of the faith have done before us. And so there it is for the second Sunday of Advent, a smelly, unwashed, raging prophet from the desert, blocking your view for now of the Christmas crib so that you will come to your senses. That's what this Sunday's liturgy is all about. It's what our scripture is all about. Again, in short, no joy without the Jordan, no Jesus without John, and no real rejoicing without real repentance. For once again, as he does every year, the prophet has spoken. <laughs>